Hello, everyone. Um, I am uh, Gangadharan uh, from the Adobe India team. Uh, I am a part of uh, Adobe Experience Platform as a senior engineering manager there. Uh, firstly, thank you all for coming out, and thanks to Aerospike for giving us this opportunity to share our experiences with Aerospike on uh, Kubernetes. So before I get into that, I just want to set a little bit of context. Uh, so we are, as I mentioned, a part of the Adobe Experience Platform. Uh, the Adobe Experience Platform has a vision to uh, centralize and standardize customer data across the enterprise uh, so that uh, you know, this enables 360-degree profiles, uh, helps uh, data governance, data intelligence, and uh, do this across, of, across all channels, right? And uh, we want to do this, uh, now many, uh, many uh, companies have started building data lakes and data platforms. Uh, one challenge uh, that, that's been seen is that uh, by the time the data is in, the customer experience is often over. So Adobe Experience Platform, we are keen to try and uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, the, the only platform which has uh, the velocity and volume management to go along with it so that we can uh, react to the, uh, we, can, we can engage, we can uh, uh, inform the customer experience as it is actually happening. So um, we, we see a few challenges with this uh, space in general, right? I mean, the, mo uh, the moment you start using CRM systems uh, for uh, you know authenticated data, and then you have uh, anonymous data in the form of cookies. Uh, getting an end-to-end -end customer view becomes a challenge uh, to bridge the authenticated and anonymous data and get an end-to-end -end view. Uh, so this uh, is because we have disparate data, disparate data schema, and the taxonomy is not exactly aligned. Um, we are also uh, uh, looking, when we look at uh, data uh, intelligence and uh, insights, uh, the data firstly needs to be structured in a way that it is actionable. And uh, that again requires that there be a standard uh, uh, schema for all data pertaining to a customer experience. So in, in addition, uh, we also have all this data moving through uh, not so reliable APIs and systems, and uh, we really need to uh, get a handle on that. So we are trying to solve all these problems in the Adobe Experience Platform. Uh, we are uh, doing this through uh, open uh, data initiatives uh, and in investing in the ecosystem so that uh, you know, it can integrate with all of your existing uh, investments. So uh, we are uh, basically uh, the, we call this customer experience management. And uh, we are uh, trying to solve this uh, problem at scale. Now, to do all this, uh, especially on the edge, we heavily use Aerospike to deliver things at the velocity that we are looking to do to achieve this. And we do this. Um, across uh, multiple uh, cloud environments. And this goes from Adobe owned data centers to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Azure, AWS, so all, all cloud types. And uh, we are uh, uh, looking at Kubernetes. We have been using Kubernetes with uh, stateless systems a lot. And we are looking to also use Kubernetes with stateful systems like Aerospike in the uh, uh, in the coming days, and uh, we have uh, started investing in uh, building a uh, Kubernetes operator for uh, Aerospike. Uh, our interest here is to share uh, how we are looking to approach this, and also get a lot of feedback from everybody to as to uh, how, how this would work. Um, so uh, the reasons we are trying to build this is to uh, scale our operations. Uh, we want to normalize uh, 
you know, how we manage our deployments across all these cloud providers where we see all these uh, differences in the way we would deploy and manage stateful, stateless systems and then stateful systems, particularly RSpike in this case. And uh, the operators of uh, the pattern in the Kubernetes ecosystem was something that looked like a right fit for this. Um, obviously, uh, this is uh, not a, a, a very straight, uh, very simple exercise as uh, relatively speaking, stateless systems, somewhat easy to uh, containerize. I think the problem is relatively better understood in the industry. But to containerize and uh, uh, scale stateful systems is uh, somewhat of a newer area. Um, we also see that there are existing RSpec operators in open source. They're, they're, they're pretty good. Um, uh, we we uh, went and researched all this, and uh, we felt uh, now was the time the Kubernetes ecosystem was in a place for us to start uh, building something like this. And we have a certain approach that we are taking. And that's why we are building uh, our own. And that's particularly things like, um, I mean, we talk a little bit more about this during the session. But uh, we're looking at new abstractions that have come up in the Kubernetes ecosystem, like stateful sets. And then um, uh, there are the Kubernetes ecosystem is rich with uh, deployment techniques like Helm charts and uh, uh, we are also trying to, uh, you know, transfer all of our operational knowledge into code and uh, have, a, have a platform for that. And then the operator pattern was a good choice for that, like uh, availability zone fault tolerance when we deploy in the cloud and things of that nature. And finally, uh, a very practical reason to do this is, well, we want to go beyond our use of Kubernetes for stateless systems into stateful systems and, and build that uh, experience and knowledge so that we can apply this in other places as well, even outside of Aerospike. So the goals we set ourselves up with in this exercise is uh, some of the things I've been alluding to. Uh, this is basically minimize manual management effort. We want to scale our operations to a lot more data centers without necessarily having to have a lot more manual intervention and handholding. Uh, we want to spend as much time as possible building features than uh, managing the systems. And uh, we also don't want to compromise on performance qualities. I think. Uh, all of us using Aerospike can uh, are probably the, here for one of the one of the main reasons being the performance and the latencies that we see. So we don't want any of that to be compromised. Uh, we are trying to be sensitive to how Aerospike takes advantage of all the hardware optimizations, and uh, so we are we are very careful to try and uh, keep that intact. Uh, although at at first blush, when we say containers, it, it seems all virtualized and whatnot. Um, uh, then we also are trying to, as I mentioned, make sure the fault tolerances that are specific to cloud, and sometimes cloud, cloud provider specific, can get uh, captured in this uh, operator uh, framework uh, that we are using to extend, uh, that we are going to extend. And uh, we also, as I said, want to align how we manage our stateful and stateless systems so that there can be this one recipe and make the system fully turnkey. Um, so those are the goals with which we have started this exercise. Um, so a little bit of introduction about Kubernetes here before we go forward. Um, Kubernetes is a Greek word which means helmsman, and uh, that's uh, where that name comes from. It's uh, basically a container orchestrator. Uh, what we mean by that is it takes Docker containers and orchestrates it's um, management across a, a farm of uh, Kubernetes worker nodes and uh, does many other helpful things like uh, put it on top of, uh, you know, L4 VIP and some load balancing on top of it and uh, things of that sort if you need that in your application. Um, it's uh, open sourced by Google in 2014. It builds on top of uh, 15 years of internal operational knowledge on their end. Uh, it's highly extensible, and uh, this is not to be said very mildly. It's uh, it's the, the plug the way to plug in uh, plug into Kubernetes is really quite seamless. It's it's uh, they, they are they're very uh, actively looking at uh, trying to make sure that any component that starts to see the semblance of needing extension, uh, 
uh, doesn't stay within their main core code base, and then you can actually plug it in separately, and you don't have to co contribute into the main Kubernetes project. And it's really democratic like that. And uh, it's being extended by everybody from the cloud providers to make Kubernetes more uh, seamless to run on their particular clouds to the application developers, like in our case, when we are trying to look at maybe putting stateful systems on, uh, on Kubernetes, um, it allows the necessary extensions. And the model is clearly, is, 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 is quite nice. We will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, furthermore, the ecosystem around Kubernetes is pretty good now. Uh, we are starting to, we have, we have uh, Helm charts and other things to uh, package whatever it is that we have built, and it's like an RPM equivalent, and uh, lets you deploy your uh, applications onto Kubernetes in a seamless way. And then if you're looking to do things like CI, CD, and uh, uh, have pipelines, uh, Spinnaker and uh, other such choices are uh, very available. They, they integrate really well with, uh, with uh, Kubernetes. So that's a brief introduction of Kubernetes. And uh, uh, we, at this point, I, I, I would like to establish uh, some of the key concepts uh, behind Kubernetes that, especially uh, those that are relevant to uh, our thoughts behind uh, building an Aerospike uh, operator on Kubernetes. Um, so, uh, the very first concept, uh, to take a little bit of bottom-up approach here, right, and uh, we won't necessarily spend too much time with this approach, it's just a couple of slides to just introduce Kubernetes as a concept. Um, so take a very bottom-up approach with uh, Kubernetes uh, to just get started. The most basic primitive, I would say, in Kubernetes is a pod. Uh, we are probably familiar with Docker containers, and uh, a pod actually is a set of Docker containers. And I know that might seem a little, if, if this is uh, uh, something we are discussing, uh, something that's new, then it might seem a little uh, unnatural at first to use a primitive that's a little more than a container. But the thinking behind that is typically applications have, you know, before you start horizontally scaling them, you have this concept of sidecars and assists, right? Maybe you have monitoring, maybe you have something that has to do backups. And that has to go with every node of your application. So uh, they take the concept of container and let you actually give a closely related family of containers. And they, again, leverage Docker containers, all the power of Docker containers where it's lightweight virtualization and where it is um, you know, really not a hypervisor that is uh, going to slow down your runtime in any way. It's just namespacing, right? That's, that's kind of what containers are doing for you underneath at the system level. Um, and they uh, make sure that uh, you know that all these containers have the ease of using the same volumes and same file system and same network interfaces. So it looks from the outside like it's, it's just one logical host. That's, that's the best way to describe it. If this were physical machines, you, you, when you run uh, an RSpec daemon, if you also have an Ansible running there or something else, I mean, maybe a, a better example would be a monitoring system, uh, a monitoring agent. Uh, th those would be your containers. And then your pod would be all of that put together. So that's the most basic primitive. And then to re like really zoom out really quickly and, and look at the whole Kubernetes architecture, right? Uh, what we have is uh, a master and then a bunch of uh, Kubernetes nodes is where your applications are actually running. Um, the Kubernetes master is uh, actually uh, made up of uh, the main API server uh, and uh, it uh, has and etcd for managing all the objects that you define and update onto the Kubernetes uh, configuration. And then it has a very uh, central uh, component called the uh, controller manager. It's basically where you register what is called controllers. And controllers are uh, systems which are basically a feedback loop. They look at what you're asking for uh, in terms of the state of the system, what it actually is. And it just tries to do the you know, negative feedback and, and bring the system to where it should be, as, as requested uh, by you, uh, the operator. So then uh, we have scheduler, which would actually allocate your workloads to various nodes. Uh, and on the node itself, you have um, a lot of uh, standard things, like the, the, the agent on the node, the kubelet. And then you have Docker, which actually manages your runtime. And uh, you also have what is called a kube proxy, and that helps with taking ports out of your containers and uh, making them available on the load balances and whatnot. And uh, the uh, Kubernetes uh, network uh, architecture is also highly extensible, and uh, 
you know, you, you can make sure that uh, we doesn't have to resort to bridging or anything. And the networking is also quite, you know, it can directly integrate with uh, cloud providers networking and your Docker containers can become directly addressable in the cloud environment. Um, so with that, uh, we are uh, we are done with uh, a basic overview of Kubernetes. Now I'd like to start taking the uh, problem of putting Arrowspike on Kubernetes and start going through it uh, piece by piece. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, Arrowspike state. And uh, just to lay out what all we have been looking at so far in terms of Arrowspike state, it's been the uh, usual suspect of the actual block device for where you store the data, but also uh, system metadata that uh, is put on the file system by Arrowspike and uh, a shadow device, which typically is something that we add when we are on the cloud to make sure that uh, the, uh, you know, the data can survive the loss of a particular node, uh, albeit it's still within the availability zone, but you can still use the shadow device to rehydrate your node if it comes back from a uh, VM level failure. Um, so these are the three state considerations, and uh, we will look at how this is getting addressed in uh, Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, some, some relevant concepts really quickly before that. Um, so the way Kubernetes does uh, arbitration of persistent volumes and, uh, and, and giving it off to, to uh, applications that need it, it, it lets the operator configure what is called a storage class, and that can use cloud provider-specific uh, um, volume providers, or uh, it can be something that's just using the file system. But the storage class is essentially an abstraction which is configured by the operator to say that, um, the, the human operator in this case, uh, to say that uh, this is uh, uh, where you can allocate new volumes from as requested by the applications and this is how they can be given out. And the application in turn uh, makes a claim. And uh, the Kubernetes uh, master makes that association and binds it and, and leaves that intact. Um, so this is, this is basically how uh, persistent volume management happens in Kubernetes at a, at a 10,000 feet view. Now, if we go and try to see how this gets applied to our problem, uh, let's start with the system metadata. That is a standard local uh, file system mount, which then uh, is uh, fulfilled by a local file system storage class. The other two uh, uh, require a little bit more because we, we want to use block device storage. And uh, very recently, the feature of uh, block device mounts has gone into beta in Kubernetes. And we can leverage that to make sure that we actually give, when we give the local SSD to the Kubernetes container, it's actually given off as a block device, not as somewhere in the file system. And as we know, that's the ideal way of running uh, Arrowspike in uh, production. So it, it does uh, help us with that, in that Kubernetes now has uh, block device volumes. And we can leverage that in, in what we are doing. And the same story with the uh, NAS or remote volumes for the shadow device, in that you can use them as block devices as well. You are not restricted to using them as part of the file system. So with that, uh, we can actually define the appropriate storage classes for the system metadata. System metadata, by the way, is the place where um, all the uh, uh, the uh, metadata for running of Arrowspike, uh, like when you did a truncate and whatnot, is basically being tracked. So we need to make sure that not just the namespace state, but all this is also being uh, preserved. So that's, in a nutshell, how we are doing state. This just summarizes what we went over. It basically leverages uh, local persistent volumes, not just the uh, Kubernetes, not just has the ability to uh, to uh, give out volumes from, say, EBS or some other uh, network storage, but it all can also issue the volumes from the local SSD on your, the ephemeral SSD device on the particular VM. So all this is done well. I mean, um, Azure, AWS, they all have their um, extensions into Kubernetes, which, which helps you do all this seamlessly. Um, and then uh, we use the raw block volume support to good measure to make sure we continue to use Arrowspike in a block device fashion. Um, next, we move on to the cluster level considerations, uh, how to make sure the Arrowspike cluster is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, uh, set up in a, in a, uh, in a uh, manner in which it is uh, scaling well in the cloud. Uh, 
the very first thing that comes to mind with that is the node identity and uh, the uh, we need to make sure that if it's unlike stateless systems if a particular aspect node were to go down and were to be provisioned by Kubernetes elsewhere, the notion of what is the ID of that node stays. Because it's not just that the state has to stay with the system. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more as to how, that's, that's another thing. If the node goes down and comes back, it's not like a stateless system where the node can come back on some other host. If your SSD is still intact and the uh, Kubernetes host on which Kubernetes, there are a little bit of uh, terminology uh, overlaps here. The Kubernetes node itself is the host on which you run things. So that, uh, let me just call it Kubernetes host for now. The, the, the host on which you're running is still around. You want that pod to come back there because the SSD is left behind there. You don't really want to go somewhere else and make this look like an entirely new node. So you need that stickiness of the local SSD. And um, you also want to diversify across your failure domains. Um, so what by that I mean availability zone, by that I mean making sure all your Aerospike nodes are not on one physical host, for example even if you have enough SSDs to actually do that. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the coming slides. But as usual, just to talk about it, I want to introduce a relevant Kubernetes concept to say how that's being addressed in the approach we're taking here. Um, so Kubernetes has this uh, uh, recent addition of uh, stateful sets. Uh, stateful sets are basically a a uh, incremental evolution over what Kubernetes had as the staple before, which is uh, rather uh, there was a, there was a, a concept called deployments in Kubernetes, and that was working very well for stateless systems. But they recognized that the primitives or the uh, nuances of stateless systems, so stateful systems, typically require a little bit more stickiness uh, to the pods, and they came up with uh, stateful sets. This is an abstraction that will help you scale out your pods onto multiple hosts and uh, help with the necessary stickiness that you'd be looking for. To start with, the pod ID is uh, highly stable. It's not like if the pod gets rescheduled somewhere else, it comes up with a new ID, it's, it's highly consistent. And uh, so is the pod host name. And uh, the pod also does not uh, move across the host, uh, especially if you tie it to a local persistent volume. So it gives you all the, uh, behaviors that you'd expect for a typical stateful system. And uh, it uh, keeps the volumes intact. It doesn't delete them once the pod is gone. So it also gives a lot more uh, guarantees in terms of order in which the pods are scaled up and scaled down. Like uh, it gives everything a consistent ordinal and then it, when it scales down, it takes down the highest ordinal. When it scales up, it adds one after the highest ordinal and things of that sort. So that's uh, Kubernetes stateful sets. The other part that we were looking to address, if you remember, is uh, how do we deploy across availability zones or failure domains? We talked about failure domains being a, a challenge. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of them, actually. One is to make sure that you do rack awareness and you distribute your pods across a couple of availability zones in the case of AWS. I think um, the t term in Azure is uh, fault domains. Uh, <coughs> So uh, regardless, it's uh, the data centers within the region. And uh, we uh, are looking to take the approach of building a custom scheduler, which is going to be very deterministic about alternating the pods across the availability zones, giving them the right rack ID as you put them in the right availability zone. Typically, uh, the Kubernetes hosts come tagged with the availability zone they're in. Each cloud provider does this the right way. So we plan to integrate with that to make sure we know uh, which pod is on which availability zone. Uh, Kubernetes also provides the concept of node anti-affinity. So we intend to leverage that to make sure that um, uh, the pods do not get, the RSpec nodes do not get scheduled on the same machine, uh, All of uh, more than one on the same machine, in fact. So actually, one more thing about that is uh, that the custom scheduler is actually honestly uh, easier than it looks. It, it sounds a little scary to say a custom scheduler, but it's nothing like uh, a, a adding a scheduler to, you know, in the, in the Linux kernel sense or anything. It's just a script that you contribute in, and that just has to, it can be even in shell, in fact. It can be in Python. Uh, it just has to help make the decision of, uh, for your subset of, uh, of uh, artifacts or pods, uh, 
uh, what are the rules to follow and which node would you like to pick amongst these available nodes. It's not in any way a very real-time component that you're building and that's going to be uh, part of the Kubernetes runtime. So it's, it's nothing as tightly integrated. And this is sort of the things I was mentioning by saying that the extensibility of Kubernetes is pretty good and uh, th that's, that's why we are looking at uh, doing this. Uh, so the, uh, this was a summary of what we just covered again as to how we are uh, leveraging the uh, stateful uh, sets a lot and also adding uh, the custom scheduler to make sure that we uh, you know, deploy RSpike. Uh, if we choose to have cross availability zone, rack awareness and things of that sort, we leverage uh, the uh, uh, bo both availability zones in the right way. Uh, with that, I want to take on a few uh, other miscellaneous operational considerations. Uh, when it comes to rolling updates, uh, we uh, the stateful tests have a st meaningful update strategy, so it, it does do the updates one part at a time by default. Uh, it also stops the rolling update on f the first evidence of failure and then rolls back that node to the previous uh, version. So all of this just seems like we can uh, uh, take wholesale from stateful sets and move it into uh, the uh, system we are building and just use stateful sets for doing these things. The next thing is to scale and uh, to scale down especially one needs to be making sure that we wait for the rebalances and migrations and uh, we can again make sure that uh, the system is, you know, and we'll cover a little bit more about this later, we can make sure that whatever you're building is aware that scaling down from say seven nodes to three nodes is in a replication factor of two is not simply a matter of just taking down four nodes all at once. You have to wait for the uh, migrations to happen. Um, the rebalances and migrations more precisely. So uh, we are able to uh, interject into those flows and say we need to wait for those conditions to be met before we scale down. And like I mentioned earlier, stateful sets is very consistent about the order in which it uh, goes out and scales the systems up and down. So. Uh, it uh, will make sure that when it adds more nodes, it does it only on the, uh, after the highest order, and when it removes nodes, it removes them in the reverse order. So you always have that guarantee as to, you know, which node is going to go down next or which node is going to be having a rolling update next. Finally, we come to the operational consideration of monitoring and this kind of leverages the sidecar feature we talked about a little earlier. Um, and uh, in the pod and we intend to have a Prometheus uh, container as well running alongside the Aerospec daemon in the uh, pod. So lastly, before I go to uh, something that kind of tries to bring all of this into a, a holistic picture, the last individual aspect I want to talk about is backup and restore. And uh, there are, as you might imagine, uh, standard abstractions for uh, doing this in uh, Kubernetes like jobs and cron jobs and they're exactly what they sound like. So you can define those <coughs> uh, tasks and uh, you can have container images that can fulfill those tasks. And uh, we are uh, adding support for uh, multiple backends in that uh, for the various blob stores like uh, S3 or Azure blob store and things like that. So finally, uh, with all this, we have a whole salad of things we just talked about, right? We talked about custom scheduler, uh, custom scheduler, Prometheus sidecar, um, a whole bunch of things. And to say that we would come and literally configure each of these by hand uh, doesn't make sense. And that's where operator pattern exactly makes sense. You want to tame this jungle and you want to uh, make sure that you can package all of this in an abstraction that makes sense. And the operator pattern is very simple. It just says that the user is able to give what is called a custom resource definition. The resource definition is just that. It's like a REST API for a resource. By itself, it does nothing. Um, it just um, uh, uh, provides you a way to describe the, uh, the resource, in this case, the Aerospec cluster resource in, 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 a, in a nice language, and then transform it into low level resources like stateful sets and pods and whatnot. And then the controller, uh, remember the controller we talked about which has that feedback loop, you can write your own. And that can look at this custom resource definition and spawn off 
owned resources underneath it, which is the stateful sets and other things which Kubernetes already comes with. So that transformation is what you achieve through just these two things of custom resource definitions and operators. And that's exactly what the operator pattern, which is a design pattern, uh, is actually encouraging us to do. And that's how uh, stateful systems are trying to come on board uh, Kubernetes. So how that looks like when it works is that the user would update the specification of the custom resource once it's all set up. And then the aerospace controller that we build would look at that custom resource definition and try to align the definition of the owned objects, right? Uh, the stateful sets and other things that we created as derived objects from that custom resource. So uh, that's basically what the operator uh, uh, looks like. And we, of course, have to go ahead and uh, install uh, the custom controller, uh, which is just actually, interestingly enough, another pod and another deployment on Kubernetes is no way special. The only speciality I think it has is you give it a service account access and say it has the right to issue other Kubernetes commands. And otherwise, it's just one more thing. Even Kubernetes' own basic things like deployments and stateful sets are managed now through custom controllers. And that's how much this uh, pattern is extensible that a lot of core features are also built as custom controllers. Um, Finally, uh, as we mentioned, we need a way to, we need our RPM or our Debian equivalent, right? We need a way to package all this and have somebody install it on their cluster. And that's where Helm comes in. Helm is an RPM equivalent it, uh, for the system. It just packages all this uh, controller, the uh, custom resource definition, uh, all the necessary dependencies into a package that you can just go ahead and install on your Kubernetes cluster. And then you get the operator running, and then you're good to go with starting defining your CRDs. <clears throat> um, it manages updates, rollbacks of the software version of the custom controller and whatnot. Uh, finally, the, uh, dis we need things. We do need. We do see the need for things beyond the operator itself in managing the cluster. In that, for instance, what if you want to cut over to a new cluster? The operator itself can manage one RSPI cluster, maybe. And then it can uh, uh, scale that up and down. But what if you want to cut over your data to another cluster? You're now looking at a workflow backing up data from the first cluster, putting it on, uh, again, using those custom resource definitions makes it easier. But then you then have to go and spin up a new cluster, put the data there, and then shut down the old one. You need a way to sequence all this. And that's where Spinnaker pipelines, which Spinnaker usually used for CI, CD, can also be used for operational uh, workflows. Uh, and the other advantage is when you have a, a, a whole multi-region deployment with their own Kubernetes clusters and RSPEC clusters in all these places. You want to coordinate all that centrally. You don't want to have to log into each place and do something. That pipeline can be central. The spinnaker that you use the, uh, can be a cent at a central location, and it can talk to all these regions and coordinate across all these regions. So the user flow looks like you install the Helm chart, uh, which gives you the uh, controller and the custom resource definitions. You define the RSPEC cluster. You Restore your backups as needed. Uh, there will be periodic ba backups already happening through those cron jobs. And um, uh, Sp uh, Spinnaker could be used to coordinate across multiple regions and uh, manage higher order workflows on top of this. Uh, so with that, I just want to leave with saying uh, where we are. Uh, we, as I said earlier, we are still um, uh, developing on this, but we plan to open source this uh, soon. And we're looking for, uh, you know, everybody if, if, uh, whoever is interested to contribute, uh, you know, operational expertise, make this able to handle even more operational scenarios, and uh, anybody interested in uh, uh, being an uh, early tester for this. Uh, there are many more things we can build on this. Uh, this is, we just want to start here. I mean, you can think about, you know, something that is very, you know, very far, uh, something that takes a, uh, it's, it's quite far away for stateful systems, but things like even auto scaling at some point. This is just right now saying scaling when a, op, when a human wants to scale this. And uh, looking at resource management on the cloud, maybe a benchmark, so we just bring up the whole RSPEC cluster, bring up the benchmark, run it, and get the metrics out, and then shut it down and uh, things of that sort. So uh, that, that's, that's all I had here is an e email address you can reach us at uh, when you, e if you're interested for more information, glad to share. And that's it.
Uh, any questions? Yes. No worries. That's an interesting question. Uh, uh, if I'm, oh, sorry, yes. I think if I understand the question, the question is, can we not just do block device? Can we do a partition inside the block device in terms of a? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, so you are looking at installing a uh, file system on the device? The question is that uh, can we pre partition a block device and use those partitions? Uh, we are uh, using right now this feature in the in the full block device form. It should be possible, but uh, we haven't explored that uh, just yet, so don't have an answer on that. Okay. But I'll be happy to come back to you on that. Yeah. Uh, can I go to my next? Please. Um, the next one is that the block device interface for SSD or ephemeral they have specific implementations on the different clouds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is that uh, how do we how do we be normalized across all these clouds if uh, the w way in which you get to ephemeral devices is quite different in an Azure environment versus an AWS environment, for example? The answer is those storage classes we talked about a little earlier. So these uh, storage classes are defined on top of uh, uh, specific extensions written by all these cloud providers. So if you go look at Azure or AWS, you'll find that I'm just trying to get back to that slide. Um, if you uh, look at Azure or AWS, they'll already give you ways to uh, just, you know, through a little bit of configuration, so define a storage class on top of EBS or Azure's equivalent of that. And uh, uh, when it comes to devices right on the file system, uh, you, you can always uh, use this local storage provider, as it is called, and uh, do a little bit of configuration on it. Again, that's where the operator pattern helps. You can actually take care of some of these cloud-specific nuances and uh, uh, make sure that's part of what the operator itself is so that when somebody installs it, they have a cloud-neutral uh, view through your operator. So you, you try to kind of um, take care of some of those nuances in your operator if it's not already taken care of by the cloud provider when they provide these. And I know that for things like the external volumes, right, EBS and uh, uh, the equivalent with Azure, uh, you already have the necessary integrations in Kubernetes. When you get EKS or AKS, they, those things come out of the box. The last question. Um, I'm going to assume, because you're using Elastic Awareness and other features, that this is an operator for Enterprise Edition, because there is actually you know, a nice operator for Community Edition out there, but it's very limited. <coughs> the fact that all these you know, operational features only exist in Enterprise Edition. Is that the goal for your project? Yes, the goal for our project is to be able to, we, we use Aerospike Enterprise Edition, so uh, the goal is to uh, uh, be able to take advantage of those features like rack awareness, yes. Um, let's talk at lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like I just went through the tip of the iceberg there. More questions, I guess. Thank you. Thanks. Yep, yeah, please. Uh, we have we, are, we we have done some early tests and so far there is not much of a difference. Yes. 
Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, the question is: Has there any performance difference in our performance uh, when we try to compare performance of uh, the regular way of deploying Aerospike and through the uh, Kubernetes environment? Uh, we are still doing more performance tests, but so far we haven't seen much of a difference in that. Yeah. Uh, looks like there are no more questions. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you.